Assalamu alaikum, I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak. This is a presentation to practical aspects of anatomy of the pharynx and larynx. <coughs> the pharynx is a muscular tube lie behind the nose, behind the mouth, and behind the larynx. This muscular tube therefore allow passage to uh, the air from the nose and to food from the mouth. And therefore it could be divided as a nasopharynx behind the nose, oropharynx behind the mouth, laryngopharynx behind the larynx. Uh, first we will describe the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx uh, extends uh, from the base of the skull superiorly. The base of the skull forms the upper uh, boundary of the pharynx as a whole and the upper boundary of the nasopharynx. While inferiorly the nasopharynx is limited by the level of the palate. Or we can say inferiorly the nasopharynx is limited by a fold of a muscle which is called pazavant muscle. This muscle is a U-shaped muscle, lies on the sides and posterior wall of the nasopharynx at the level of the palate. When this pazavant muscle contracts, it produces a ridge that is seen here in this figure. And elevation of the soft palate up unite with this ridge to close the nasopharynx from the oropharynx. The inside of the lateral wall of the nasopharynx shows the opening of the auditory eustachian tube, which is also called nasopharyngeal tube. This opening of auditory eustachian tube is recovered from above by a C-shaped fold called the tuber elevation, fold of a mucosa called tubal elevation or torus of the tube. The posterior border of this C-shaped torus of the tube descends downward forming the salpingopharyngeal fold, which is a mucosal fold covering salpingopharyngeous muscle. Uh, below the opening of the tube is a mucosal fold covering the levator villipalatini muscle. The mucosa surrounding the auditory eustachian tube contain, contains lymphoid tissue, and this lymphoid tissue is sometimes called as tubal tonsils. Behind the torus of the tube and behind the salpingopharyngeal fold, this space is called pharyngeal recess of Rosenmuller. Sometime we may introduce a catheter from the nose and then trying to passing the catheter into the eustachian tube for surgical purposes. If the catheter wrongly pass behind the eustachian tube, it will pass into the pharyngeal recess. And here it will perforate the pharyngobasilar fascia and then perforating the internal uh, carotid artery resulting in massive bleeding during catheterization. You can see that the opening of the auditory eustachian tube lies few centimeters behind the inferior concha of the nose. The other feature of the nasopharynx is not in the lateral wall. The eustachian tube is in the lateral wall. The other feature is in the roof of the nasopharynx, which is a collection of lymphoid tissue that is called pharyngeal tonsils, or could, is called the adenoid. The adenoid lie on the superior and posterior surface of the nasopharynx. Sometimes this adenoid is inflamed, infected, especially in children, and therefore it will be hypertrophied. It will increase in size, closing the air passages of the nerve of the nasopharynx and uh, making the a uh, patient uh, breathe from his mouth. This condition of a large pharyngeal tonsil or a large adenoid is most commonly seen in children and uh, because the adenoid will close all the nasopharynx, the child will breathe from his mouth. In addition to that, the large pharyngeal tonsil or large adenoids will close the auditory tube resulting in partial deafness. Of course, it is treated surgically by removing a surgical operation to removing the pharyngeal tonsil or removing the adenoid. In adult, such a condition does not occur because the pharyngeal tonsil atrophied in adulthood. Regarding the oropharynx, which is behind the mouth, it is limited above by the level of the palate, or we can say by the level of the pazavant muscle, and is limited below by the level of the epiglottic cartilage, the cartilage of the larynx, which is this one, the epiglottic cartilage. 
the inside of the uh, oropharynx shows the uh, palatine tonsils on its lateral wall. The palatine tonsils is limited anteriorly by a fold and posteriorly by a fold. Anteriorly, the fold is called the anterior pillar or called palatoglossal fold because it is formed by mucosa covering palatoglossus muscle. While the posterior boundary is called the posterior pillar, which is a mucosal fold covering palatopharyngeus muscle and sometimes it's called palatopharyngeal fold. The floor of the uh, palatine tonsils is formed by the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx. And during examination, you may see crypts inside the tonsils between the posterior and anterior pillars. These crypts are a demarcations or a markers for the tonsils during examination, during clinical examination. One of these crypts may be large and is called the deep tonsillar cleft or a crypt. Blood supply to the palatine tonsils is from tonsillar branch of facial artery, which is the main blood supply, but also the palatine tonsils is uh, supplied by branches or twigs from the lingual artery, ascending pharyngeal artery, and uh, twig from pharyngeal uh, ascending palatine arteries. The main venous drainage of the palatine tonsil is the paratonsillar vein. Uh, this vein and many other veins draining the palatine tonsils to the pharyngeal venous plexus. You can see that the paratonsillar vein, the main venous drainage of the tonsils, descends from the palate, from the soft palate, and being in the floor of the tonsil, of the tonsillar fossae, in, the, in between the uh, palatine tonsils and the superior constrictor muscle. We said before a while that the bed of the palatine tonsils is produced by the superior constrictor muscle. And uh, therefore, when we remove the palatine tonsils in surgery, this paratonsillar vein may result in a troublesome bleeding after operation and should be cauterized or ligated. You can see this paratonsillar uh, vein is a tributary of the facial vein. It is lateral to the tonsil, inside the bed of tonsil. Finally, in regard to the oropharynx, we have to say that behind the tongue is the epiglottis, as you see in this figure. This is the tongue, and behind the tongue, this is the epiglottic cartilage of larynx. The space between the epiglottis and the back of tongue, which is this space, is called valicula. This is a clearer picture to the valicula. The valicula is the space behind the tongue, between the tongue anteriorly and the epiglottic cartilage posteriorly. The valicula is limited on the sides by the lateral glossoepiglottic fold and is divided in the midline by a median glossoepiglottic fold. Clinically, the valicula is important because it is a site of a common site for foreign body lodgement, just like a fishbone or others. The tablets of a drug sometimes stops here, there. Regarding uh, clinical anatomy, you may introduce a mirror into the nasopharynx, into the oropharynx, in order to, to see the nose from back. This technique is called posterior rhinoscopy of the nasopharynx. A mirror is introduced by the mouth to the oropharynx and thus you can see the nasal cavity just like in this figure. Another important clinical point is that the adenoid, which is the pharyngeal tonsil, plus the tubal tonsils, which are lymphoid tissue on the stake and tube, plus the palatine tonsils, plus the posterior one-third of the tongue which contains lymphoid tissue and is called lingual tonsil. These four lymphoid aggregations, the adenoid, tubal tonsil, palatine tonsil, and lingual tonsil of the tongue, on the right and left side form a complete ring protecting the nasopharyngeal opening and is called Waldair ring of lymphatic tissue. 
This figure shows you that the posterior one third of the tongue is a lymphoid tissue containing uh, what's called lingual tonsil. This lingual tonsil plus palatine tonsil plus the tubal tonsil plus the adenoid form a complete ring around the oropharyngeal opening, uh, nasopharyngeal opening, which is called Waldire ring of lymphatic tissue. Finally, we have to describe the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx, sorry. The laryngopharynx lie uh, behind the larynx. This arrow, the red, the yellow arrow, indicates the larynx, and you can see that the laryngopharynx is behind the larynx. It is connected with the pharynx by the inlet of the pharynx, which is this. This is the inlet of the, of the larynx, sorry. So the laryngopharynx lie behind the larynx. It is connected with the larynx by the inlet of larynx. This inlet of the larynx is formed anteriorly by the epiglottis on the sides by a fold, which is called aryepiglottic fold, and posteriorly by a fold between arytenoid cartilage, which is called interarytenoid fold. So the laryngopharynx is connected anteriorly with the inlet of the larynx. The laryngopharynx is extending from the uh, upper border of the epiglottis down to C6 vertebra, to the lower of border of C6 vertebra. Below the level of C6 vertebra, the laryngopharynx and the pharynx as a whole continues with the ossophagus. So the C6 vertebra, the lower border of C6 vertebra is the lower end of the pharynx or lower end of laryngopharynx and it is the upper uh, end of the oesophagus. On the sides of the inlet of the larynx, this is the inlet of the larynx, as we said it is formed anteriorly by the epiglottis on the sides by the aryepiglottic fold and posteriorly by the interarytenoid fold of mucosa. On the sides of the aryepiglottic fold, the laryngopharynx shows a recess which is called pariform recess. This recess is also a site of foreign body lodgement here, just like a fish bone, just like to the valicula that we have just described. Deep to the mucosa of the pariform recess is the internal laryngeal nerve. And sometimes either fish bone or any foreign body lodged in the pariform recess, and we try to remove this uh, foreign body by a hard uh, object, we may injure the mucosa, and then we may cut the internal laryngeal nerve deep to the mucosa of the pariform recess. And thus injury to the internal laryngeal nerve during foreign body removal deep to the mucosa of pariform recess will result in loss of anesthesia or loss or anesthesia, loss of sensation or anesthesia of the upper larynx because the internal laryngeal nerve supply the mucosa of the upper larynx. And in that condition, during the swallowing, food may pass or fluid may pass into the larynx through the inlet, resulting in pneumonia because, you know, food and drink is carrying bacteria. And normally, if uh, food and drink pass into the inlet of the larynx, we will choke and cough. But because the internal laryngeal nerve is injured during the procedure of foreign body removal, and the upper larynx is, uh, is uh, anesthetized with that loss of sensation. Food will pass and will not feel that the food pass into the inlet of the larynx and then we will not cough uh, after passage of food or drink. This food or drink when it passes into the inlet of the larynx will reach the lung and producing lung abscess and pneumonia. Uh, the posterior wall of the the laryngopharynx show overlapping of the three constrictor muscles that extends its overlapping extends to the level of the vocal cords inside the larynx. The structure of the wall of the pharynx, the pharynx is made of two set of muscles, inner longitudinal muscles and outer circular muscles. The longitudinal muscles are salpingopharyngeus muscle that extends from the uh, uterine uh, tube, from the uh, auditory eustachian tube to the side of the pharynx, palatopharyngeus muscle, extending from the subpalate to the pharynx and stylopharyngeus muscle. 
which is extending from the style of the process. This is a figure to style of pharyngeus muscle. And uh, palatopharyngeus and uh, salpingopharyngeus had been shown previously. In addition to this inner longitudinal muscle fibers, the pharynx is surrounded by outer circular muscle fibers, which are superior, middle, and inferior constrictor. And before a while, we said that these four three constrictor muscles overlapping down to the level of the vocal cords in the, uh, forming the back of the pharynx uh, and overlapping down to the level of the vocal cords in the laryngopharynx. The superior constrictor shows a space above it that is not containing muscle fiber. This space above it is between the upper border of superior constrictor and the base of the skull, and it is filled by the pharyngobasilar fascia, reinforced medially by the pharyngeal ligament, which is a midline ligament giving insertion to the constrictor muscles. Here it is noted as uh, pharyngeal rough, the same of pharyngeal ligament. The lower level of the pharyngobasilar fascia is the level of the preservant muscle, and superiorly the pharyngobasilar fascia is attached to the posterior border of medial trigoid plate and to the base of the skull. Sometimes there is a weak region in the posterior wall of the pharynx in between the constrictor muscles. This weak region is called Killian's dehiscence which is this one, the Killian dehiscence. Uh, the Killian dehiscence, the weak region, is defined or uh, described as that the inferior constrictor is composed of two parts. One of them is called thyropharyngeus because it's originating from thyroid cartilage, and the other is called cricopharyngeus because it is originating from cricoid cartilage of the larynx, and I will show you that here. This is the inferior constrictor. We can see that it takes some of its origin from thyroid cartilage. And so this part of inferior constrictor is called thyropharyngeus. And this part of inferior constrictor takes origin from cricoid cartilage. And so it is called the cricopharyngeus. Between these two parts, the thyropharyngeus and the cricopharyngeal parts of inferior constrictor, is a gap which is called Killian dehiscence, shown in this figure. This is thyropharyngeus of inferior constrictor, and this is the cricopharyngeus of inferior constrictor, and this is the Killian dehiscence between them, a weak region between them. Uh, Sometimes uh, perforations may occur in this region during the endoscopy of the oesophagus, oesophagoscopy. And sometime mucosa may bulge, of, of the pharynx may bulge through this weak region, resulting in a pharyngeal diverticulum. There are four spaces in between the three constrictor muscles from above downwards. The first step is space or gap is above superior constrictor. It contains the auditory tube and the ascending palatine artery and levator palatine muscle. The second gap is between superior and middle constrictor. It contains the stylopharyngeus muscle with the glossopharyngeal nerve supplying it and also it contains the stylohyoid ligament. The third gap is between the middle and the inferior constrictor muscle. It contains the internal laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal artery. Both these structures perforate the thyrohyoid membrane. The fourth gap is below the inferior constrictor. It contains the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the inferior laryngeal artery. All muscles of the pharynx are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus, except the stylopharyngeus, which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. This figure shows you the pharyngeal plexus. The pharyngeal plexus lie on the lateral wall of the pharynx, mainly on the middle constrictor muscle. And the pharyngeal plexus is formed mainly by branches from the vagus nerve, the tentacranial nerve, and the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the nanocranial nerve. And also the pharyngeal plexus contain fibers from the symp cervical sympathetic chain. Regarding sensory nerve supply to the mucosa of the, of the pharynx, the nasopharynx 
the mucosa receives sensation from branches of the pterygopalatine ganglia reaching the nasopharynx via the maxillary nerve, while the oropharynx receives sensation from glossopharyngeal nerve, and the laryngopharynx receives sensation from the internal laryngeal branch of vagus nerve. Blood supply to the pharynx is from ascending pharyngeal artery, facial artery, superior and inferior laryngeal artery. Starting with the larynx, the larynx uh, extends from the level of C3 vertebra to the level of C6 vertebra. Or we can say that extends from the inlet of the larynx that is behind the tongue, behind the epiglottis, to the uh, lower border of the cricoid cartilage of larynx. Below this level of cricoid cartilage is the trachea. The larynx is an organ that serves as a valve uh, and it serves as an uh, open valve for respiration, closed valve for phonation, and a protective valve during deglutition. The skeleton is shown of the larynx in this figure. The skeleton of the larynx is made of three single cartilage, which are first thyroid cartilage, second cricoid cartilage and third epiglottic cartilage in addition to these three single cartilage the thyroid cricoid and epiglottic cartilage there are three paired cartilages which are arytenoid cartilages above the back of cricoid cartilage and above the arytenoid are a bilateral corniculate cartilage and we have a cuneiform cartilage in the ari epiglottic fold which is not shown in this figure. So the paired cartilages are two bilateral arytenoid and two bilateral corniculate and two bilateral cuneiform cartilages. To describe the feature of each of these we will start with the thyroid cartilage which is the Adam apple. The thyroid cartilage is formed of right and left quadrilateral lamina. The posterior border of this lamina project up as a superior horn or cornu and project down as an inferior horn or cornu. The inferior horn articulates with the sides of the cricoid cartilage by a synovial cricothyroid joint, while the superior cornu or superior horn is, uh, and superior border of the lamina is attached to the hyoid bone by thyrohyoid membrane. The anterior border of the lamina is fused in the lower part of it. In the lower part of the anterior border of the lamina, there will be a fusion to form a laryngeal prominence. The upper part of the anterior border of the lamina is not fused to form the thyroid notch or suprathyroid notch. Of course, the lower part of the anterior border, the laryngeal prominence, is prominent in male to produce Adam apple. This is all about thyroid cartilage, and now we will describe the second cartilage, which is single cartilage, just like thyroid cartilage, which is a cricoid cartilage. Anteriorly, the cricoid cartilage is formed of a narrow arch, while posteriorly, the cricoid cartilage is formed of a wide lamina, and therefore, it is a ring-like cartilage. As we said before, the inferior horn of thyroid cartilage articulates by a synovial joint with the cricoid and the position of this synovial joint, the cricothyroid joint, is at the junction of the arch and lamina. The arch is anterior and the lamina is posterior and at the junction on the sides of the arch and lamina is the synovial cricothyroid joint. Also the posterior lamina of the cricoid at its upper border, it shows articulation with the bilateral third arytenoid cartilage. The arytenoid cartilage articulates with the lateral side of the upper border of the lamina by also a synovial joint. This is all about the cricoid cartilage. The third single cartilage is the epiglottic cartilage, which is leaf-like cartilage, just like the tree leaf. The cricoid cartilage is attached to the back of the 
uh, upper border of the thyroid cartilage in the midline below the thyroid notch. The thyroid cartilage, uh, which is this one, uh, could move backward to close the inlet of the larynx or the vestibule of the larynx. Starting with the paired cartilages, the first paired cartilage are the arytenoid cartilage. The arytenoid cartilages are uh, pyramidal in shape. They are three-sided pyramidal shapes cartilage. They have uh, at its base, of course, the apex is above, above, which is called superior process. Sometimes it is not called the apex, it is called superior process. And the base show two processes, a lateral process, which is called um, muscular process and, uh, and, and a medial process which is called vocal process. To this vocal process the vocal cords are attached. The corniculate cartilage are small pieces of cartilage attached to the apex of the pyramidal arytenoid cartilage. I said before a while the apex of arytenoid is sometimes called upper process of arytenoid cartilage. The Corniculate cartilage lies in the ari epiglottic fold that forms the inlet of the larynx. This is the inlet of the larynx. It is formed anteriorly by the epiglottis, posteriorly by the interarytenoid fold of mucosae, and on the sides between the epiglottis anteriorly and the arytenoid posteriorly, the bilateral fold forming the inlet are called ari epiglottic folds. And you can see that the corniculate cartilage is inside the area epiglottic folds, which are the sides of the inlet of the larynx. The cuneiform cartilage are also small pieces of cartilage lying in the area epiglottic folds. That's all about the skeleton of the cartilage of the larynx. This is a sagittal section of the uh, larynx. This is the epiglottis and that is the ariepiglottic fold, and this is the arytenoid cartilage, and this is the posterior lamina of cricoid, this is the anterior arch of a cricoid, this is the thyroid cartilage. You can see how the epiglottis is attached to the thyroid cartilage, to the upper border of thyroid cartilage below the thyroid notch. So you can see here in this mid-sagittal section, you can see the cavity of the larynx, the inside or the interior of the larynx. And in this section, the mucosa of the larynx is removed. You can see deep to the mucosa of the larynx is a fibrous membrane called conus elasticus. This fibrous membrane deep to the mucosa of the lower part of the larynx extends up from the arch of cricoid cartilage and extending up. The interior border of the conus elasticus is thickened and is attached in the midline to the lower border of thyroid cartilage and thyroid notch, forming the median cricothyroid ligament. While the upper border of the conus elasticus is a free border, it is not attached to anything, and it forms the vocal cords, or called vocal ligament. This vocal cord or vocal ligament is covered by mucosa forming the vocal cords producing the sound that extends from the vocal process of the arytenoid cartilage to the back of thyroid cartilage. The vocal cord is not only formed by vocal ligament, which is thickening of the upper free border of conus elasticus. The vocal cords is also produced by a muscle, which is called vocalis muscle which is represented by the upper fibers of a muscle called thyroarytenoid muscle. Thyroarytenoid is a big muscle and the upper border of it is called vocalis because it is present in the vocal cords and we will study that soon. The space between the right and left vocal folds or cords is called drimma glottitis. And when the vocal folds become near to each other or away from each other, movement of the vocal cords laterally or medially will change the size of the rim glottitis, which is the space between them and thus changing the tone of voice. So the conus elasticus could be defined as a fibrous membrane 
deep to the mucosa of the larynx below the vocal cords. It extends between the arch of the cricoid and the vocal cords. Deep to the mucosa of the upper larynx is another membrane, fibrous tissue, which is called the quadrate membrane or quadrangular membrane. This membrane, the quadrate membrane or the quadrangular membrane, extends from the side of the epiglottic cartilage to the side of arytenoid cartilage. So it extends from the sides of epiglottic cartilage anteriorly to the sides of the arytenoid cartilage posteriorly. Also the quadrangular membrane or the quadrate membrane have a lower free border that is forming another ligament called vestibular ligament. Sometimes it is called false vocal cord and that vocal ligament is called true vocal cord. The vestibular ligament is called false vocal cord sometimes in order to consider the vocal ligament as the true vocal cord. And as we described before a while that the space between the right and left vocal cords is called rimmaglottitis, the space between the right and left vestibular fold is called rimma vestibuli. Regarding the inside or the interior of the larynx, the cavity of the inside of the larynx is divided into three parts, uh, upper, middle, and lower part. The upper part, which is called vestibule of the larynx, lies between the aryepiglottic fold and the vestibular fold. And below the vestibular fold, between the vestibular fold above and the vocal fold below, is the second part, which is the middle part, that's called ventricle of the larynx, or called sinus of the larynx. And below the vocal folds is the infraglottic part uh, that extends down to the uh, lower border of cricoid cartilage, after which there is interior of the trachea. Uh, regarding muscles of the larynx, muscles of the larynx are two groups, extrinsic and intrinsic muscles. Extrinsic muscles are the suprahyoid muscles and infrahyoid muscles. These muscles move all the larynx up and down during the swallowing. In addition to the suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles, which are extrinsic muscles of the larynx, and I think you know the name of them, which is which are enumerated here from the uh, you know them from the uh, anatomy of the anterior triangle of the neck. In addition to the suprahyoid and infrahyoid extrinsic muscles of the larynx, we have many small muscles which are intrinsic muscles of the larynx. These small muscles connecting different parts of uh, the cartilaginous skeleton and thus moving parts of the larynx, not moving all the larynx as the extrinsic muscles, but moving the different parts of the larynx and thus changing the length and tension of the vocal cord and also changing the size and shape of remaglotitis between the vocal cords. Of course, the name of these uh, intrinsic muscles are listed here. You have lateral cricoarytenoid muscle. The lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, which is this one, produce adduction of the cords, of the vocal cords. Adduction means that the right and left vocal cords uh, become nearer to the midline. And on the contrary, the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, which is this small muscle, produce abduction of the vocal cords, in which the vocal cords will move away from the midline and widening the remaglotitis. There are muscles that are attached to the arytenoid cartilage specifically, which are transverse arytenoid muscle, which is this one, and uh, the oblique arytenoid muscle, and the aryepiglottic muscle. And also we have a cricothyroid muscle. Cricothyroid muscle is seen not from inside of the larynx, but cricothyroid is seen from the outside in the uh, anterior triangle between thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. It produces tension of the vocal cords. And thyroarytenoid muscle, which is this muscle, produces relaxation of the vocal cords. All of these muscles act as a sphincter closing the larynx during the swallowing to prevent food from entering into the larynx and thus to the airways. Except the posterior cricoarytenoid uh, muscle, uh, it opens the sphincter of the larynx. It is not closing the uh, larynx just like a sphincter.
Regarding nerve supply to the larynx, the first nerve supplying the larynx is superior laryngeal branch of vagus. The vagus nerve, the tentacranial nerve, and the carotid sheath give superior laryngeal nerve. This superior laryngeal nerve descends downward and forward and divides into external laryngeal nerve that runs with the superior thyroid artery supply the cricothyroid muscle. This is one of the muscle, intrinsic muscles, cricothyroid muscle, which is a tensor of vocal cords. And the other branch of superior laryngeal is called internal laryngeal nerve. This internal laryngeal branch of superior laryngeal perforates the thyrohyoid membrane with superior laryngeal branch of superior thyroid artery. The internal laryngeal nerve is sensory to the upper part of the mucosa of the larynx down to the vocal cords. Sometime during thyroid surgery, you may need to ligate the superior thyroid artery or you must ligate the superior thyroid artery in order to do operation removing the thyroid gland in thyroidectomy. And during ligation of the superior thyroid artery, you may injure the superior laryngeal nerve or the external laryngeal nerve. If the external laryngeal nerve is injured during ligation of the superior thyroid artery, the cricothyroid muscle, the intrinsic muscle, is paralyzed and no tension of the cord will occur, resulting in a weakness of the sound, weakness of phonation. Also, injury to the internal laryngeal nerve, which is a branch of superior laryngeal nerve during the operation, will result in sensory loss of the upper uh, part of the laryngeal mucosa down to the vocal cords, and this may lead to uh, loss of choking when food or fluid pass into the inlet of larynx, resulting in passage of food without coughing, and so the food will pass into the lung, resulting in aspiration pneumonia and uh, lung abscess. This is the first nerve to the larynx, which is the superior laryngeal nerve branch of vagus. The second nerve to the larynx is the recurrent laryngeal branch of vagus, which is called sometimes inferior laryngeal nerve. This nerve is motor for all mo intrinsic muscles of the larynx, except the cricothyroid that's supplied by the external laryngeal nerve. Also, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is, a is a sensory to the lower part of the mucosa of the larynx down below the vocal cords. The, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is also possibly injured during surgical thyroidectomy when we ligate the inferior thyroid artery because it is close to the inferior thyroid artery. And if uh, a new unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured during ligation of inferior thyroid artery, the vocal cord on that side will be in a neutral position between abduction and adduction and uh, it will not move because of damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. But this uh, unilateral injury will not affect phonation too much because the, rec the uh, opposite vocal cords, which is, not, which is normally supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve in cases of unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, the opposite uh, vocal fold will move normally and compensate for the damage of the uh, other side injury of recurrent laryngeal nerve. But if the recurrent laryngeal nerve during thyroid surgery is injured on the right and left side by lateral injury, there will be no phonation. The vocal cords, the right and left vocal cords, will be in a neutral position between abduction and adduction, and there will be no sound of production. On the contrary, if the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right and left side are partially injured, not completely injured, therefore, Abduction of the vocal cord is lost only because abduction occurs first during injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Abduction is lost first during partial injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Therefore, abduction of the cord will be very strong. And so severe abduction due to loss of abduction by partial recurrent laryngeal nerve, the severe abduction will close the remaglutitis and the patient will suffocate and he will need to open the trachea in order to be able to breathe because the cords will become adducted in the midline, closing the airway of the remaglutitis, and we need uh, an opening in the trachea, which is called tracheostomy, to make the patient rebreathe. The patient will have a very difficulty, in a severe difficulty in breathing, which is called citrida. Of course, uh, any injury to the uh, superior laryngeal or recurrent laryngeal nerve is also associated with mild difficulty in breathing. 
movement of the skeleton of the larynx by the intrinsic muscles is either movement of thyroid cartilage, which is anterior and posterior, and it is described here with the muscles forming them, or movement of the arytenoid cartilage, which is either gliding movement or uh, lateral rotation or rotation movement. Also, this movement producing abduction and adduction of the cords, and the thyroid cartilage movement produce tension and relaxation of the cords, changing thus the phonation or the sound tone. Sometimes we may introduce a mirror from the mouth to see the laryngopharynx or the inlet of the larynx. This procedure is called indirect laryngoscope mirror. You can see by this mirror many structures as this figure and that figure show you. You may see that. You may see the vocal cords, vestibular folds. You may see the pyriform recess on the side of the aryepiglottic fold. You may see the valecula, which is the space between the tongue and the epiglottis. You may see the back of tongue, the epiglottis, and the aryepiglottic fold. Or you may introduce this tubular instrument, which is called direct laryngoscope, to see the larynx more clearly. That's all about the topic. Thank you very much.